I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I want to say briefly about the meditation that um, you may have recognized that I followed the beginnings of and somewhat adapted the mindfulness of breathing teaching from the Buddha, certainly the first roughly three or four steps of it. And uh, those steps are very fundamental. And then on the basis of them, we opened out into this mingling of three qualities that, that are really central, which is a mingling of um, heartfulness, uh, spaciousness, and groundedness together. Uh, the f initial steps are first to be aware that you're breathing at all, and then second, be aware of more and more of the detail of breathing, that you're breathing in when you're breathing in, right, breathing out when you're breathing out. And then um, next, getting a sense of uh, breathing as the whole body or the whole body of the breath, um, breathing as the body as a whole. And then from there, um, the kind of classic next step is to start moving into very kind of emotionally positive states of being. And I took us at that point more toward spaciousness and groundedness together and then bringing in the heart. You could play around with the order of that, but, but those are fundamentals. Those are good fundamentals. And um, like many of the fundamentals, when we actually pursue them, we get fundamentally good results. So I commend those to your, to your attention. So I'd like to talk with you about a topic that has actually really been a wave I've been riding myself for the last <clears throat> six, nine months, really, in a way that kind of has surprised me. And there's been a, a lot of learning in this, which is coming to terms with mistakes and exploring appropriate regret and remorse. So before getting into this topic in any depth right here, I want to just name that this can stir things up. So I want you to be especially careful with yourself, please, for my sake, if only for yours, let alone for yours. Um, and just kind of take it easy here. Uh, beware certain tendencies in us that can get very self-critical, very mean to ourselves, sometimes as an internalization of others who've treated us in that way. Um, and be gentle with yourself. And you might want to use this uh, to explore some mild and minor mistakes. Uh, and then gradually, as, as you're able, to move out into things that are, that are more consequential for you. So uh, as a foundation into approaching this topic, uh, I want to name three things as a kind of co-refuge. They are first to rest in lovingness. Remarkably, and in ways that are still mysterious to me, even psychologically, let alone beyond, um, when we're rested in a sense of our own lovingness, our own warmth, our own genuine compassion, our own lovingness, it's a lot easier to face our mistakes. And it's a lot easier to, to practice with them. So lovingness. Second, um, big picture perspective. For example, recognizing that everyone makes mistakes. Everyone. And I'll get into what I mean by a mistake in a minute here, but a big picture perspective. And also that can see unfolding phenomena as like the river of time with countless currents intertwining and flowing through it. Uh, and our own 
person process, mind and body process, the Rick process, the you process, um, is simply one of many, many currents. And even that current of the person process is the result of many other little mini currents coming together and then passing away to make the current of our own particular life process. That's part of a big picture perspective. And um, so a big picture perspective, including what feels like a panoramic view or the bird's eye view, a 10,000 foot view, which neurologically uh, can calm reactivity. And it, it also calms a certain um, beating yourself upness or ruminating about things, big picture perspective. That's the second major aspect of your refuge in engaging this topic of mistakes, regrets, and remorse. Um, and then third, what I explored with you, uh, I believe last meeting, how do you know you're a good person? And there are multiple ways to actually know you are a good person. Uh, you know, a basically good person. Uh, as Suzuki Roshi put it, perfect as you are with room for improvement. <laughs> a basically good person. These three together, lovingness, big picture, remembrance of your own natural goodness, your own worth, your own beauty as you are, your own good intentions, your own sincerity, and so forth, that um, is foundational to this exploration. And if you find yourself starting to get upset or rattled or just flooded, whoosh, come back to this refuge and reestablish yourself in refuge, lovingness, big picture, understanding and, and awareness and a knowing of your own goodness, okay? So then to get into it, uh, you know, uh, I made a mistake one time and I was horsing around with friends in the back of a pickup truck. I was probably about 12, uh, three or four other friends were with me and somebody shoved me in the truck and I fell backwards and I could have fallen onto the hard driveway, you know, with a terrible fall, I could have broken my neck. And um, not as a gymnastic person at all, nor at that point, especially not very athletic either. Somehow I had the presence of mind to grab the edge of the back of the pickup truck. So I grabbed that edge as I was falling backwards and literally did a backflip and landed on my feet. And jokingly with my friends, I said, ta-da. But actually, you know, it could have really been quite tragic. So I made a mistake there. I was horsing around. I wasn't careful. I put myself in a risky position. I made a mistake. Um, I've made mistakes while rock climbing. You know, I've gone off route. Uh, I've made quite consequential mistakes um, in withholding love from my mother in my war with her, in effect, my conflict, my cold war, uh, when I was a teenager, teenage boy, as a way to kind of fight back at her well-intended, but kind of overwhelming con controllingness and criticalness. People make mistakes um, in the ultimate, in the ultimate, there are no distinctions, there's no mistake, there's no failure, there's no success, great. In planet Earth, sometimes we make mistakes. Um, <clears throat> we make a mistake on a math problem, or we, you know, write down the wrong phone number. We make a mistake. Uh, maybe we, <clears throat> you know, are fiddling around in our glove compartment, or we're looking at our phone while driving, and <clears throat> something bad happens. Mistakes happen. Mistakes happen. <clears throat> They're real. Then what, right? Then what? Some mistakes are minor, some are major in their consequences for yourself and for other people. Some mistakes can be corrected. Some mistakes are irrevocable. That, that event can never be changed. Um, I think about mistakes in certain things I've said to people or the ways I've said them. And we could say that at the time I didn't know any better, 
Sometimes I did know better, but I was just too mad or rattled or stoned or buzzed. I made a mistake, you know, and some mistakes are really a matter of regret. Like it was unskillful. I wish I had done something different. <clears throat> I made a mistake one time um, that I, I just didn't know better, which was I was joking around with a friend of mine who is African American, and we were talking about gardening. And uh, I was making a joke related to, you know, people have a green thumb if they're a good gardener. And I had heard the saying that some people who are not very good gardeners, like me, had a black thumb. And as soon as the words were out of my mouth, I thought, oh, man. Um, and I talked with her later on, and she said to me, essentially, yeah, uh, black is bad, yet again. And um, yet, you know, Rick, I, I understand. I know where you're coming from. You, know, you have a good heart. We're cool. Um, and yeah, <laughs> boom, lesson learned, right? So I regretted it. I did not feel I was a bad guy for doing it. It wasn't like it was a moral fault. Arguably, maybe I could have, you know, been more attentive, particularly with a background awareness, you know, of, of the kind of context there, uh, historically in America and recently. But then there are the things that we truly deserve to have remorse for. And a very important point is to, you know, implement skillful correction, maybe with some regret, much more than being swallowed up by guilt, remorse, or shame. Key distinction there. You know, there's certain things that I've done that I really regret. Uh, it wasn't a moral fault. I was just dumb, or I didn't slow down to research something or learn about something, like a, a good grad school to go to, or, uh, you know, the long-term consequences of saving no money for the first <laughs> 30 years of adulthood, more or less. Uh, you know, but that's not, th those are not worthy of remorse. There wasn't a moral fault there. It was just unskillful. Maybe it was clueless. Maybe it was impulsive. You know, maybe it was dumb. But yeah, not a moral fault. You know, not a matter of remorse. Maybe a matter of regret if you've had to pay a price and you, or you regret the impact on others. Um, I regret um, the impact on my friend of my kind of thoughtless comment about having a black thumb as a gardener. But I don't feel I need to feel a lot of guilt or remorse or shame about it. Now, this is a personal judgment, and this is really important. Very often, we defend against recognizing our mistakes or we resist other people you know, bringing our mistakes to us because we're, we're afraid of getting swallowed up in guilt, shame, and remorse. Or maybe another person is coming at us with a lot of moral critique. You know, how dare you? You should be ashamed of yourself. You're a bad person. Terrible. No good person would do that thing. Um, you ought to feel horrible about yourself. Whoa. And... Often the time, you know, you don't really deserve to feel remorseful or guilty or ashamed, but there is skillfulness to be gained in that feedback. And you get to decide for yourself what is worthy of um, remorse and what is worthy merely of regret and skillful correction moving into the future. This is an incredibly important point incredibly useful for me to claim for myself the power of discernment, to decide for myself what column something belongs into with a willingness, with a willingness to be open to remorse. Because paradoxically, that willingness to be open to remorse can open up the door to the bliss of blamelessness in which you can genuinely feel, whoa, <laughs> lesson learned. <laughs> You know, next time go north instead of south. <laughs> Take the right turn instead of the left turn. Uh, 
you know, next time go down the tunnel that has cheese in it rather than the tunnel with no cheese. But I don't need to feel like a bad person, you know, for that mistake I made. Very, very, very important. So then how do we practice with the recognition now that I've kind of defined some terms here? Mistakes, regret, remorse. Um, and in regret can be skillful correction alone for the future going forward. On the refuge, as we get ready to practice with this, like I said at the very beginning of um, heartfulness, right, lovingness, and big picture understanding, everyone makes mistakes, a lot of mistakes. If you haven't made a lot of mistakes in this life, you have not been on the playing field. <laughs> we all make mistakes. And um, a knowing of yourself as a good person, that's refuge. Okay. What are some simple, three simple headlines that go together in practicing with regrets and remorse? The first is recognizing, oh, what's a mistake? Or what would have been a better way? Which is relates to something I'm loosely calling a mistake in the past. And let's not get all tangled up in the words here. We understand there are things that like, huh, you know, yeah, I learned from it and all of the rest, blah, blah. There were, you know, silver, there were silver linings in those clouds, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, it was a mistake, <laughs> right? I was driving a, a van recently that I was camping in and it had dishes in a cabinet. And one of them was a kind of a special dish that my wife and I have, have bought and, it, and an expensive dish. And I put it in the cabinet. And as I was driving down this bumpy road, uh, the cabinet hinges in this kind of cheaply made cabinetry broke and the cabinet door swung open and everything inside went clattering on the floor of the van going down this dirt road at a reasonable rate, 20 miles an hour, but bumping along. And this very special dish landed on the floor of the van and it broke, boom. And realistically, I I probably, I could have realized, I could have looked more carefully at the cabinetry. I could have thought more deeply about what might happen if the door swung open. It was a mistake. I'm okay with it being a mistake. So the first thing is a willingness to admit mistakes. And one of the chapters in my book, uh, Making Great Relationships, just has the title, Admit Fault and Move On. And I'm using the word fault really loosely. And, you know, sometimes um, when you look back at an interaction, 90% of you, maybe 99% of you is feeling like, oh yeah, I showed them. Oh yeah, made that point. Yeah, I mean, it was deserved. But that little 1% voice of wisdom, rut row, <laughs> oh, not so fast, big fella. <laughs> Whoa, slow it down. Hmm. Maybe there was something that, you know, there was to learn here. There was to learn here. We have an opportunity to learn from what I'm broadly calling mistakes. So in terms of practicing with our mistakes, the first of the three major headlines here is openness, discernment, recognition, recognizing. Yeah, yeah. that was a wrong turn. Um, <clears throat> and even if that wrong turn brought some good lessons, often we learn from our mistakes. That's a lot of what I'm talking about here, how to learn from our mistakes and how to practice with the feelings of regret and remorse. That's my topic here how to learn from our mistakes and practice with feelings of regret and remorse. That's a big deal. Um, you know, even if we uh, learn from our mistakes, even if, you know, the mistake opened up certain things, still, it's okay to look at certain things and go, you know, yeah, whatever you want to call it, mistake, oops, 
um, goof, major breakdown, perpetration, big problem, you know, you decide. Um, you know, I see Tony's comment at five minutes past the hour, and it's okay. Um, so Tony says, I have regrets on decisions, but I do not consider a mistake. And I think that's a very important point. There are costs sometimes, and we may regret certain costs. I think Tony's speaking to that very astutely here, you know, and these are good distinctions to track. It's a big topic here. So we might have, we might have, you know, a sense of costs and regrets about them around things that we did with our eyes open. So I think that's that's really clear. That said, I really want to focus on whatever you consider to be a mistake. And in the last uh, months, I've just been startled by an upwelling of um, recognition, regret, and remorse about some key mistakes I made with somebody. And uh, I won't get into the personal details. Sorry. Uh, I think it's not a mistake <laughs> to avoid getting into the personal details here. But internally, I know there were mistakes. I made mistakes. And I think it's important to be able to face our mistakes because if we keep at bay the authentic, wise recognition of mistakes. We can't process them well. We can't learn from them. And very often there's buried regret and remorse that starts boiling up, which it has for me in the last six months. I can say happily, I, I feel I've really practiced with waves of that. And I'm, I think on the other side, who knows, I may not be yet. Um, but I think there's an important place for just recognizing mistakes, right? Including the ones that other people are bringing to us. So recognition, that's the first of the three really headlines here, right? Second is to take responsibility for our part in the mistake. And a mistake, in the broad loose terms I'm using here, is like a current in the river of time. That current is made up of many things. If you look back on a major mistake, what you consider to be a mistake, um, most likely there were dozens, if not hundreds of factors that led to it. Most of them not about you personally. Even the ones that seem to have run through your sense of selfness um, are, them, are made up of mini currents, you know, currents made of mini currents, made of micro currents, made of nano currents. That's reality all the way down to quantum foam. That's reality. And so um, the second key is to take responsibility for your part, which means acknowledging and recognizing what wasn't your part. All right? So, um, you know, to give you a personal example, uh, in my very early 20s, just right out of college, I stumbled into leading workshops. I was put into a, asked to step in for someone who couldn't do a personal growth workshop. This would be 1974, probably, uh, maybe early 1975. And I think at that point, you know, I turned 22. And I'm a pretty young guy. And I discovered I was I was good at it. So, and also it was Los Angeles and the, the rising tide of the whole human potential movement there. And uh, one thing led to another. And a couple of years later, uh, age 23 and 24, I was running my own personal growth workshop company with teaching, you know, hundreds of people, what? <laughs> with four friends and partners. And we made a living doing that. And it was, it was good. It was really good. Uh, and then I made a mistake. Um, for good reasons and bad reasons, I decided to end the whole thing and walk away from it and kind of go on more of an apprenticeship myself in actually learning how to lead personal growth workshops because I had no particular training. I had no license in psychology. I, you know, I just had, I think, a natural gift. Uh, for being able to do it and, and a sincerity to help people. 
um, I think there's some kind of line, God loves, you know, children and fools. <laughs> <laughs> I was a foolish child in some ways, a very young adult. So in any case, I, I ended it all. And um, the good reasons were that I, in many ways, was not actually prepared for the depth and, and intensity of the uh, experiences and the, the activities we were doing in these workshops. And luckily, every, everything went okay. We avoided disaster, but still, I wasn't really prepared to be doing that deep work with people. That was a good reason. Bad reason was that at a certain level, deep down inside myself, related to my own experience of uh, being a kind of shy kid and dorky and pushed to the side in groups, I was nervous about sticking my head up. You may relate to that. Fear, fear of standing out. You know, there, I believe there's a proverb in Japan, perhaps, uh, the nail that stands out gets hammered down. And at some level, I lost my nerve. And I made another mistake, which was that I didn't take a breath and seek counsel from people who are older and had more perspective on the process of a person's career, perhaps my parents. I didn't talk with them about this decision. I didn't really talk about it with many other people. Um, I had friends who were more established in their careers. I could have gone to them, but I didn't. Those are mistakes. I'm, and, I, and I'm responsible for them. And it was quite consequential. Looking back, it would have been better to have sort of slowed things down, gotten some counsel, and rapidly gone into grad school, graduate school in psychology instead of ending up there 10 years later after a fairly bumpy but informative road. Um, so the second thing is to take responsibility for your part. Maybe you've made a mistake with another person. You know, they were maybe a jerk. Maybe they were hostile to you. Maybe, um, you know, you had to work with them and they were cold and dismissive and you just could feel the weight of their disdain every day. That was on them. Okay. Uh, and then maybe you just blew it or blew up at them in a meeting and it was consequential. He ended up looking pretty bad and maybe it was the beginning of the end of that job there for you. Um, and what's your responsibility in the matter? And it's up to you to decide what's your responsibility. And what enables that to, to happen uh, is to be prepared to discern what is not your responsibility. Interpersonally, one of the most powerful things we can do with other people who are bringing an accusation at us or a complaint or a grievance or a critique, even if they love us dearly, and we love them dearly too, but they're, they're bringing something to us. In effect, they're basically saying, you know, the billboard flashing over their head is saying, you screwed up in some way, okay? Even if it's, you know, euphemistic, even it's kind of implicit in what they're saying, maybe they're hinting, you know, the thought balloon over their head is, you screwed up. Okay, what do we do then? You know, it's so powerful to be with someone, let's say you, when they're bringing that, I'll call it a complaint to you, a criticism, a grievance. It's so powerful after you kind of ground yourself. It's really powerful if you are actually sincerely interested in discovering whatever you did wrong or what it would look like in the future if they got what they wanted. In other words, and, 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 and you are engaged in a process in which you are taking responsibility for your part of the matter. And um, you're prepared to not take responsibility for what's not your part, knowing that it may not be skillful to say that out loud, but inside your mind, it can be very skillful to know, hmm, well, I'm not responsible for this and that, and I can put in correction for this part that I am responsible for going forward. Know what you're responsible for, all right? Know what you're responsible for. And then there is, I'll call it making amends, which is especially helpful if you're dealing with remorse, remorse, guilt, or shame, having to do with a a sense of uh, really, you know, of, of moral fault. 
of really letting somebody down, of acting in a way that uh, deep in your own integrity system, you just felt out of integrity about. Knowing that, you know, we internalize a kind of a superficial, in, I'll call it integrity system, a value system from our society and our uh, socialization, our parents, and very often is full of a lot of BS, frankly. Um, and some of that is coded in terms of gender socialization, you know, good girls X, good boys Y, right? Whatever it comes from. And, you know, part of maturity is releasing that imposed morality and discovering your own and establishing your own, which I'm calling your own core integrity system. Sometimes we know we violated our core integrity system. We did we did stuff that we're like, nope, that's not just, you know, unskillfulness. That's something that I ought to have a wince of healthy remorse about. Okay, so there's a place. You know, one of the fundamental teachings of the Buddha is that someone basically uh, in uh, who's doing real practice is open to admonishment. And uh, in the uh, in the gathering, the Sangha of the monks and, and then nuns, so monastics altogether in their own separate gatherings, the way that was done 2,500 years ago, every month they would have a thing where individual monastics would stand up and report out um, what they, their own transgressions, their own violations. And in that process of reporting, it was not about being abject with shame. It was more like telling the truth and being open to uh, others, you know, looking at you like, yeah, don't do that again. And then you would go forward. But it was, it was clean. It was like a cleansing. It was like a monthly cleansing, in effect. So, you know, there's a place for healthy response. We evolved uh, as a species. If our species did not evolve, like monkeys um, have almost no shame. You know, there are very subtle signs of uh, uh, guilt or shame um, in our, you know, mammalian cousins, but they're very, very minimal. It's in small bands as the brain tripled in volume over the last several million years in small hunter-gatherer bands, the development of the capacity for shame, um, guilt, and remorse enabled the flowering of compassion um, and altruism and um, morality. Because if basically you're in a tribe full of sociopaths, you're not going <laughs> to be very effective back in the Stone Age. But being in a band of people who have the capacity to feel uh, moral uh, gravity and remorse, that then is a, a basis, not the only basis, but is a important basis for the cohesion of the band and people really cooperating with each other and caring about each other and sharing food and other resources with each other. So the fact that we can experience appropriate, proportionate, you know, guilt or shame um, is really, really, really important. And by the way, I, I think, as Audrey says, I'm not denying um, the social emotions of, of other uh, non-human animals. And there's that, and um, uh, I think it's incredibly important to uh, recognize the sentience in non-human um, animals, those with a nervous system, certainly, uh, even a very simple nervous system. A honeybee has about a million neurons. An ant has about 250,000. It's pretty amazing. An extremely simple worm that's a millimeter long has 302. That's the least number of neurons in any animal known so far. You know, we humans have about 85 billion neurons, and it's more complex. But yeah, I definitely want to recognize social emotions in non-human animals. So as I finish here, and then I want to open it up in the last you know 10 minutes or so to questions, um, you know, you might want to just equip yourself with these six equipments, you know, that I'm naming here. 
Uh, the last one being making amends, doing what you can to acknowledge, you know, fault, acknowledge mistakes, clean up the mess, uh, recognize your impact on others, even if it was not your intent. And, you know, definitely tell the truth to yourself. It may not be possible or even appropriate or safe sometimes to acknowledge um, remorse to somebody else, but minimally you can acknowledge it to yourself and then do what you can to let it wash through you. And then, and then, and then, on the basis of these three elements I've described as this kind of foundational refuge, and then with these three elements of practice, of recognition, responsibility, and amends, as it's appropriate, whew, let it go. Let it go. Know when you have recognized it fully, when you have taken full responsibility, and when you have really done all that you can, right? Let it go. Let it go. It still may arise. Regret may arise. Remorse may arise. Sadness about things. Sadness for others. Sadness about others. It may well arise. Let it flow. Let it flow. And at a certain point, you decide when you, that's the points there, you give yourself permission to turn a corner. Out of habit, the old regrets, the old shame, the old guilts may arise. But if you've really gone through the process I've described, at a certain point, you realize, you know, I'm allowed to turn a corner. I'm not trying to suppress anything. I'm not denying anything but I'm allowing myself to turn a corner and not be burdened, not be agonizing, not be invaded or preoccupied, you know, with all of that. Um, and in that is forgiveness of yourself. Um, it's release, it's moving on. And interestingly, what I have found, and I'll finish with this point, like I said, if we, if we rest in or we start with this combination, this refuge of lovingness, big picture understanding and, rec you know, understanding and um, knowing you're a good person. Uh, and then if you do the three practices I'm describing, uh, recognition, responsibility, and repair, those are the big three, recognition, responsibility, and repair. Then on the basis of that, as you move into letting go, releasing, forgiving, you come back to the refuge you began with, right? Of lovingness, big picture, openness, and the, the feeling of your own naturally good nature, your own good heart. Thank you. And I want to acknowledge that's a really big topic and there are many perspectives on it. And, uh, I just wanted to offer some that, that I felt uh, were really relevant and certainly have helped me. So Elaine, thank you. I, I said I would go to you first and I'm glad you popped your hand up. Uh, so I'm asking you to un unmute Elaine, there we go. Okay, yeah, thank you. I can put my video on because it'll freeze the laptop. Yeah. Um, I think this fits somewhere between last week and this week. Um, and I, I, I have a sense that I have used um, practicing not anger this is, and finding out that it's a spiritual bypass. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I am now allowing myself to get angry. However, it is really hard for me not to have a sense of guilt afterwards. Mm -hmm. Um because I'm, I'm trying to integrate what you said last week and, um, you know, seeing things in context and thinking about what another person is going through and I can have a whole yeah. long list. <laughs> yeah, there you are. Yeah, I know, Before I, I can you. get to, you know what, this, this is worth being angry about. Yeah. Um, well, can I jump in? Yes. Just in the interest of time. And, Please. and uh, it's huge. Um, you might want to just detail, check out the chapter in Making Great Relationships called uh, Use Anger, Don't Let It Use You. 
And so that could be relevant. Um, I think it's helpful to make a distinction between the experiences we're having. And I think it's important to make room for uh, exp our own experiences and certainly make room for anger, especially if you belong to a group of people uh, such as classically girls and women who've had their anger suppressed and shamed and belittled and minimized and all that. So we make room for it, okay. Um, it's important also to not feed the, the beast, <laughs> as it were. It's one thing to make room for it. It's another thing to do what I'm definitely prone to doing, and I don't know if I'm the only one, to like make a case, justifying the anger. You know, so it's one thing for it to arise. It's one thing to use anger for its energy and its highlighting of of a topic. But it's very important to not reinforce it because anger comes with a lot of reward neurochemicals in our brain, dopamine and norepinephrine in particular, and it's really easy to get into it. Okay. And then there's the question of the outward expression. What's your intent? That's really key. There you are. You're, at, you're mad about something. What's your intent? Is your intent to claim your own experience and to, and to share your experience and to speak for yourself? Uh, is your intent to respect yourself? Good so far. Is your intent to um, be authentic with another person and not you know act like a robot when you're seething inside? You know, okay. Is your intent to just you know, put something on the table, hopefully in a frame in which another person can handle the level of intensity, because it is intense when you're expressing anger and people can see that we're mad. It's the most socially salient emotion, generally, anger, has huge impact. So just, you know, whatever you think, and I've made this mistake, where I thought I was communicating anger on a zero to 10 scale is like a two. And I kept, I was forgetting that other people, <laughs> on the receiving end. They have a amplifier. <laughs> they take my expressed too because anger is so salient. And for them, it's an eight, all right? Okay, so far so good. But then if the intent is to just hurt the other person, not so good. Is the intent to identify with your own righteous position, you know, again and again, not so good. Um, is your intent to prove to others who are watching that you're right or you're up and that other person is down? Not so good. Okay, I'll stop there. What do you think about what I've said so far? I th thank you. I appreciate that a whole lot. My question is, though, why does it feel like, like a second and third arrow directed toward myself? <laughs> okay. Well, that, okay, great. So I appreciate that. So step one, you're, you're, um, you're, you're in appropriate anger. Maybe, you know, Kristen Neff might call it fierce compassion. Uh, you're, you're a wrathful deity in Tibetan Buddhism in a sense. Okay, great. But you're doing it still in the frame of right speech. Okay? Yeah. Great. Then you're, at, then you're saying, hey, why do I feel bad? Um, a lot of reasons what to do about it, right? Uh, I, probably a fair amount of that feeling bad is training from childhood, right? And cultural training, I imagine. Uh, and it's just, they lied to you. Well, you're not supposed to be angry, you know. <laughs> exactly. I'll, you know, out of my mouth, when I was young and foolish, I said to somebody who was talking, who was very guilty, I said, when you feel guilty, someone's lying to you. Now, some of the time it's appropriate to feel guilty, but often it's a lie. Like you should feel bad or you shouldn't act that way. Like, well, wait a second. And part of, you know, growing is to really challenge some of the some of the shoulds that's what I said about letting working your way through you know the shoulds we've internalized and finding your own integrity system what is it for you to be a good person and maybe being a good person in, in, uh, includes the expression of anger inside the frame of right speech that I've talked about which is grounded in um, good intentions what are your intentions so if you know in your heart that um, you've, you've been angrily being a good person, <laughs> you've been being a good person angrily, then you can get some breathing room from those shits, right? And then here's, I'll, I'll finish on this one. You might think about it. 
Have you ever, Elaine, tried to imagine like a like a guide? Imagine someone who you would who you respect, seems like a wise being, and imagine them with you, side by side with you, and while you're being angry about something, and look at them from time to time. You know, and and I, I mean someone who, gosh, you know, I two friends and teachers of mine, James Barras and Tara Brock, uh, I can totally imagine looking at them while I'm being angry and what are they signaling to me? And I can imagine certain situations where they would be kind of nodding like, yeah, yeah. And probably, you know, the on their forehead would be a little Chiron going by and be a little careful, you know, don't get too far into this. And okay, so far, okay, so far. So you might imagine a guide like that. That's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it might be a committee. I don't know. Uh, just coming to my mind, Michelle Obama, you know, coming to my mind. Uh, you know, maybe a historic figure. Maybe Gandalf, Rick. Gandalf was pretty feisty. <laughs> maybe Rick. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, that was great, Elaine. Thank you very much. I, I'm sorry I couldn't get to other people. Hello, my friend Madison. I see you there. And I'm sorry, better wrap up for the sake of everybody. And, and again, whatever I've said here, it's not like the rules. It's just, it's an offering. See what you think for yourself. As the Buddha always taught, see for yourself. What has the ring of truth for you? What, you know, stands the test of time as, you know, um, fostering the happiness and welfare of yourself and other beings? That's out of regard what we talked about. 